I want to do a new sermon series starting today and next couple weeks called Better Together. If you haven't picked up on that yet, because we are simply better together. Turn to somebody and tell them we're better together. Okay, if that was a first time guest next to you, it was a little awkward, I'm sure, but uh, we are better together. No doubt. Today, I'm going to talk to you about how we're better together through prayer. Next week, I'm going to talk to you about how we're better together in tough times. Because every single one of us have been in a situation where we were going through a tough time and we were glad we had somebody going through that tough time with us or we wished we had somebody going through that tough time with us. Every single one of us. Take your Bibles and turn to Matthew chapter 18 or in your phones. The scriptures are on the app and uh, you can find them there. Matthew chapter 18. While you're turning there, it was back in 1968, there was a plane that was uh, headed towards New York, and as the, the plane was coming in to, towards its descent, the pilot realized that his landing gear wasn't working. He couldn't get the wheels to lock into position, feverishly, frantically tried to get those wheels and the landing gear to work wouldn't work. So he contacted uh, air traffic control to try to figure out what to do. He circled New York. Uh, it seemed like forever. They were running out of time, running out of answers and options and fuel. Finally, air traffic control said, we're going to spray the runway with foam and bring out emergency vehicles and you do your best. And so with that, he went on the intercom and he said this to the passengers online. He said, we're beginning our final descent told them to prepare for a crash landing. We're beginning our final descent. In accordance with the international aviation codes established in Geneva, it's my obligation to inform you that if you believe in God, you should commence to praying. <laughs> you see, the plane then performed a belly landing and miraculously no one was injured, no passenger was harmed whatsoever. If that pilot had not found himself in this crisis situation, then the passengers never would have known this provision for prayer that the airlines had in their policy. But the fact is, that's the way a whole lot of Christians are. It's not until we face a crisis or a challenge in our lives that we activate the prayer code. We activate the policy for prayer. It's kind of like the flat tire mentality. As long as we're cruising down life, uh, life's highway and our, you know, everything's handling the road just fine, then we're just kind of oblivious to God. But then as soon as we have the flat tire, we cry out for help. But I read a report recently that said 86% of Americans believe in a God who answers prayer. 86% of Americans believe in a God who answers prayer. If we believe in a God who answers prayer, there should be a little more prayer going on, right? And I know I'm talking to people who love to pray, but I'm thinking that God wants us to do even better. Just before I get to Matthew 18, 19, there's a couple of other scriptures in Leviticus 26. It says, five of you will chase 100. 100 of you will chase 10,000. Your enemies will fall by the sword before you, meaning we're better together. Deuteronomy 32, 30 says, why were a thousand defeated by one, 10,000 by only two? Or one can put a thousand to flight, two can put 10,000 to flight, meaning we're better together. But here's what Jesus said in Matthew 18, beginning with verse number 19. He says this, again, truly, I tell you that if two of you on earth agree about anything they ask for, it will be done for them by my father in heaven. For where two or three gather in my name, There am I with them. Now, I want you to understand there's two components to prayer that I want to challenge you with as I'm challenging you with this, the importance of partnering in prayer and praying together because we're better together. I don't want you to neglect your private time in prayer. Some people get a revelation of this power of agreement and end up neglecting their own private prayer. You can't do that. You have to do both at the same time. You have to develop a private prayer life where you hear from God for yourselves at the same time understanding the power in agreement. Because what happens is if you only trust in the power of agreement, you don't grow your own faith the way you should. I remember years ago when we had uh, planted our church down in Houston and a few years into that church, we decided to plant another campus down in the downtown area of Houston. We were on the north side and we planted one back in the downtown area. And we started actually with a Friday night street service, just kind of ministering to the homeless. And, and then we started a Sunday morning service down there. We rented a facility, uh, a retail center. And long story short, we, we 
uh, through management problems, we lost the retail center. So we found ourselves literally without a home for a while. So we were meeting under the bridge on uh, Sunday morning and on Friday nights. Uh, at the same time, we were at a pastor's conference, me and the downtown church pastor, we were at a pastor's conference in L.A. Uh, this was at the Los Angeles International Church or the Dream Center. And this was before they had purchased the hospital that is now the Dream Center. And they were actually casting the vision for purchasing this old hospital, the Angeles Hospital. And they were taking up an offering to buy that hospital. And my, we only had like $3,500 in the downtown church account at that time. And Eugene, the pastor uh, of that church, he punched me. He said, let's give the money to the Dream Center. I said, dude, we're under a bridge. <laughs> we need a building. We need anything. We need a tent. Uh, we just need something. And he said, let's just give it to the Dream Center. I said, look, we, we need some, some kind of good faith effort if we're going to get in anywhere maybe some of it. He said, let's just give it all away. I went, oh man. I said, I'm not feeling it. But I remember telling him if that's what you really think we should do. Cause I mean, I was in an air conditioned church on the North side of town. He was under the bridge. And uh, I said, if that's really what you want to do. And I told him this, I said, I'll ride your faith. So I told him, I said, I'll ride your faith. He said, let's do it. We gave it away. And within just a few weeks, we were knocking around on buildings and calling realtors and trying to find a space. We called about this building that was an empty warehouse and we asked about permission to leasing it. And the owner said, well, what do you want it for? And we told him, we want it for a church. He said, well, how about if I just give it to you? I said, that sounds all right to me. <laughs> and we knew that God was setting us up for sowing a seed into another ministry. He was setting us up to be able to receive a miracle for what we needed. But I got to tell you, I was riding somebody else's faith for that. But the agreement made it happen. Now, had I only continued my walk of faith, depending on somebody else's faith, I wouldn't have been in position for a couple of years later when we had started a, another Southeast campus. And I was actually going back and forth from the North side to the South side, speaking at both churches every weekend. We were in this small little building and we needed another location. And there was a church sitting on five acres, seated about 450, 500 people. And uh, I called the pastor. I said, hey, because I saw a for sale sign in front of us. I said, you want to sell that building? He says, yeah. I said, how much are you selling it for? He said, 1.1 million. I, went, ah. I said, I don't have a million dollars. But I said, I'll tell you this. I said, call me before you sell this building. Because I believe God wanted us to have it. And I said, you call me before you sell this. He said, well, just dig deep in your pockets, brother. With a, he just got kind of snarky with me. And I thought, all right, all right. That's the way you want to play this game? Fine. And uh, then a couple of weeks after that, I was speaking at a local church right down the street from our, our north campus. They, were, they had bought a new piece of property. They were trying to raise money to build a building. And so they were doing a week-long meetings under a tent on their new property and they invited me to come in and speak one night. And so I was there and while I was waiting during worship, the Lord spoke to me and said to give them a certain amount of money. I said, Lord, that's not right. I said, I'm pretty much, I'm the guest speaker. I think they're supposed to pay me to come here, not me pay them to come. And he says, you give them this much money. They need this. And I went, All right. And uh, we gave that money. It was a large amount of money and we gave it. But what was crazy is just a few weeks after that, I got a call from that smart aleck pastor at that church over there. And he calls me and he says, you still want this, this building? I said, yes, but I still don't have a million dollars. He said, why don't you come and talk to me? He came and talked to me and I got, all I can tell you is this. We got in that building for about $60,000. They wanted a million one for it. All I know is, had I only learned to operate on somebody else's faith, I never would have had my own faith to continue moving forward. You've got to have both. Both work in your life. Look what the scripture says. Verse number 20. For where two or three gather in my name, who shows up? Jesus shows up. The boss shows up. And what happens when the boss shows up? Everyone, everyone concedes to his authority, right? So whenever Jesus shows up, it's kind of like, you know, when the male dominant animal shows up, everybody else just kind of gives way. When Jesus shows up, we give in. We concede to the word. We concede to the word of God because Jesus is the word. Well, when we find out what the word says about our particular need that we're praying for, then we know what the word says. We know what the will is. 
We know what his will is. When we know what his will is, then we can stand on 1 John 5, 14 that says this is the confidence we have in approaching God that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. If we know he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we ask of him. Can I get an amen? So when Jesus shows up in the power of agreement, we know the word shows up. We stand on the word. Then we know what his will is. Therefore, we have what we've asked. A couple of weeks ago, I shared with you about building this house and how we needed a strong strong foundation of leadership and we're still working on the screening process for our deacon nomination we'll be getting that to you shortly but as we talked about the importance of needing strong leaders who could pray and support and intercede for the vision of this house in the same way that Aaron and her held up the arms of Moses so that he could continue to intercede and while he did that the children of Israel were winning the battle we need strong intercessors in this house We need strong intercessors and every single one of you who profess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior can be a strong intercessor. Every single one of you who profess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior can be a strong intercessor. Okay, all right. I was just wondering. I was just wondering. Only three of you taking me up on it. Listen, you can't say I leave that for somebody else. No, God puts the power of prayer in every single one of us. We just don't always activate it. You see, in Acts chapter 2, there were 120 that gathered in the upper room. They prayed for 10 days. Then Peter got up and preached for 10 minutes, and 3,000 people got saved. Here's what we do today. We pray for 10 minutes. We preach for 10 days, and three people get saved. Prayer changes everything, and that's why we've, we've done an incredible thing where our 24-7 week of prayer, we've, we've, we're doing it five times a year now. But this is what I believe. We're coming up on the week of Easter. The week before Easter, we always take a week and commit to 24-7 prayer. But then after that, you know, from Easter all the way to the first weekend of July, I'm sorry, first weekend of June, 50 days Revive Texas. There's going to be a lot going on. I've asked a whole lot out of you. I've asked you to open up your homes and house people. I've asked you to disciple people. I've asked you to come and to serve and go out on the streets. I've asked for a whole lot, but you know what? I'm asking for more. I'm asking for some people to pray because I don't want us just praying for the week leading up to Easter. I want us praying all the way through the 50 days of Revive Texas. I want people calling out to God, praying for a covering over every person who's going out and preach. Some of you say, I can't go out and share the gospel or I can't do this or I can't do that. I can't open up my home or I can't disciple. You can pray. Everybody can pray. And if we all do our part, we lay the foundation of prayer that will open up the doors of opportunity for God to show up. Now, this is what I realize. I'm asking a lot, but harvest time is a busy time. I remember working with my grandfather on his farm, working the hay fields every single summer. And this is what I know. When the hay is on the ground, when those bells were put out on the hay field, if you had to work till midnight, you worked till midnight to get the hay in the barn. Especially if the rain was coming, you got the hay in the barn because you didn't want to lose that harvest. Yes, it's going to be a busy time, but it's harvest time and we've got to get the souls in the house. We've got to get the hay in the barn while it's still harvest time. Is anybody hear what I'm saying? It's going to take all of us working. We may have to work till midnight. We may have to pull out the spotlights and we may have to continue to work on, on a, a little or no sleep sometimes, but we've got to do whatever we can to get the harvest harvest in the house. And prayer is going to be a big part of that. See, people praying together has been a powerful combination for years and decades and centuries. Pastors who have made significant impacts in their generations have all had substantial prayer covering and prayer ministries that have undergirded what they have done in the same way that Aaron and her held up Moses' arms. Every great movement, every great church, every great parachurch ministry has had a foundation of strong prayer. Recently, I read in one of John Maxwell's books, and he showed this uh, interesting information, this data about partners in prayer. Check this out on the screen. Partners in prayer. Charles Finney, the preacher, in 1830, Rochester, New York. In one year, a 1,000 of the the, the city's 10,000 inhabitants came to Christ. The prayer partner was a guy by the name of Abel Clary. And Finney wrote this, that Clary continued as long as I did and did not leave until after I had left. He never appeared in public, but gave himself wholly to prayer. Finney knew 
that the power of his meetings were because somebody was praying. D.L. Moody, 1872, London, England. The result, in 10 days, 400 converts came to the church where he was preaching. The partner was a bedridden girl by the name of Marion Adler. She prayed that God would send Moody to her church, and because of that, 400 people in 10 days came to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. The preacher, Canadian missionary, Jonathan Goforth. The year was 1909. The place was Manchuria, uh, China. A great revival throughout China. Look at this. While in London, later that year, Goforth was taken to see an invalid lady. As they talked about the rival, revival in Manchuria, she asked him to look at her notebook. She had recorded three days where special power came upon her for his meetings. A feeling of awe gripped Goforth as he realized those were the very days he witnessed the greatest power in Manchuria. Why? Because somebody was praying. Well, tell me prayer doesn't work just because you haven't seen the answers to the prayers that you have prayed in the time that you wanted them answered. Prayer works. Let's continue on. The preacher, Southern revivalist, Mordecai Ham. 1934, Charlotte, North Carolina. Many people were deeply moved, including a farmer's son named Billy Graham. I talked about this just last week as the, the tent meeting when Billy got saved. The partner, several business, and along with Billy Graham's father, had spent a day at the Graham's farm praying that God would touch their city, their state, and their world. And then the ripple effect just continued on because then Billy Graham in 1949 in Los Angeles had an extended campaign that resulted in a change of approach in reaching people for Christ, leading to a new era of mass evangelism. The partners, Graham had conducted several similar events with smaller results. He later realized the only difference between the LA crusade and others or the amount of prayer that he and his people had given to it. See, prayer makes a difference. And if we want to make an impact in our community, it's going to be one thing to get out there and share the gospel. We must do. It's going to be another thing to disciple people for the next year. We must do. But we have to lay a foundation of prayer that will cover this thing in order for the power of God to continue to flow through our, our community. We must pray. Can somebody say amen? Amen. You see, a prayer needs to become our focus, or maybe your focus of prayer needs to change. Maybe quit talking to God about your problem and start talking to your problem about God. Start telling your problem how big God is. Start telling your sickness that you're healed. Start telling your doubts to take a hike. Start telling your fears that they're not welcome here. Start telling your insecurities that you can do all things through Christ. And tell your weakness that you are strong in the power of the Lord. You got to start talking to your problem about God. In fact, look at this picture of Mount Everest. I read this story here recently. I thought it was, it was moving. It, it moved me. In 1924, there was a climbing expedition to try to get to the top of the tallest mountain in the world. They failed the first time. They failed the second time. Two of their team members were killed in those attempts. A few weeks later, they were in London. They were discussing their attempts and were uh, giving a report to a group of interested supporters. And as one of the climbers stood on the podium and he spoke to the crowd, there was a picture of Mount Everest there on the, on the podium or on the platform. And he turned to Mount Everest and he said, you conquered us once and you conquered us twice, but you will not always conquer us. And he turned back to the people and he said, Mount Everest will not always conquer us because it can grow no larger, but we can. And here's what I want you to realize. You've got some mountains that you faced in your life. You've got some problems that you're up against. Maybe they conquered you once. Maybe they conquered you twice, but they won't always conquer you. You know why? Because you can grow stronger than your mountains. You can grow larger than your mountains. You can grow wiser than your enemy. You can become more than a conqueror through Jesus Christ. You may be thinking, what is prayer? What good does prayer do? I mean, I've prayed and seen nothing happen. What good does prayer do? Listen, prayer changes me. When I pray, prayer changes me. You've probably seen or read some of Stormy O'Mardian's books about prayer. The Power of a Praying Wife or The Power. She's got a lot of different books on prayer. But one of the things, one of her expert excerpts in her book said this said, when my husband Michael and I were first married, differences arose between us. Praying was definitely not my first thought. In fact, it was closer to a last resort. I tried other methods first, such as arguing, pleading, ignoring, avoiding, confronting, debating, and of course, the ever popular silent treatment. And the results, 
not surprisingly, they were less than satisfying. When I did pray, often resentment, anger, unforgiveness, or an ungodly attitude clouded my communication with God. And while I may have had a good reason for these emotions, my prayers were not coming from a right heart. What's more, I was praying that my husband would conform to my ideal image of him. My prayer was for God to change him into the person I wanted him to be. However, as I went to God in prayer every day, something unusual started to change me. I was the one God decided to work on first, not my husband. Gently, the Lord began to soften my heart, humble it, mold it, reconstruct it. And as he did, he erased the bitterness, the resentment that were affecting my attitude and damaging my marriage. And this is how I came to discover a three-word prayer that God loves. Change me, Lord. Gradually, I came to realize that it was impossible to truly give myself in prayer for Michael without first examining my own heart. Listen, prayer changes us when we pray. And sometimes we spend so much time praying for others and we don't even realize God's trying to change us first. But if we'll let him change us, then we can be in a position to be able to make a difference in others' lives. Prayer changes me, and I'm going to hurry and wrap this up. He changes me. He changes others. I could talk more about that, but he also, let me just wrap it up with this. He changes the world. He changes the world. When we work, we work, but when we pray, God works. Prayer's the difference between the best that you can do and the best that God can do. I'd rather have God doing his best than mine. You see, a lot of us, when we come to know Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we understand Christ as our Lord, and we, we understand kind of who He is as our Savior, but we still live beneath our potential. It, it's like God has created this great big feast for us, and we're still over in the corner eating a bologna sandwich. We're afraid to leave the familiar sandwich for something greater that maybe is even unknown. Prayer is a lot like the difference between driving through a fast food restaurant or going to a fine dining restaurant. See, sometimes our prayers, we're like going through the drive-through and we go up and we, we yell out our, our order at this faceless machine. And we hear a voice coming back not really understand exactly what they're saying. I want a hamburger and two fries. Did you say I have fat thighs? No, no, two fries. You drive to the window and just hoping they're gonna get your order right, you know, and they throw a bag at you and just, you drive off and it stinks up your car for hours, you know. That's one way to eat. Or you can go to a fine dining restaurant and you go in and the music is soft and the atmosphere is nice and the lights are dim just right and there's somebody there who's dressed exquisite and is taking your order and prepares your meal to perfection and makes sure it's exactly what you want and I'm getting hungry just as you are wanting to go eat right now and it, sorry about that and you know and then you leave satisfied you leave oh it's perfect wonderful I want to go back to three forks now you know our prayer lives are often just like that. We either have the drive through experience, just throwing out prayers, hoping that some faceless person is going to hear and get us the right order, or you can spend time in his presence. Not rushed, not hurried, allowing the atmosphere to create an expectation of perfection, and you leave. God's presence satisfied. God wants you to have a prayer life that is like that. Every single one of us have probably had the experience of going out to our car and turn the key and nothing happens. Sometimes it's because you left the lights on. Sometimes it's because the battery's old and it needs to be changed. But other times it's because of corrosion. You look on your battery post and the battery cable, it's got this white junk all over it. Corrosion has blocked the power from flowing from the battery into your car to get it going and get it moving. 
So what do you do? You have to scrub the corrosion off. And you can use a wire brush or you can use Coca-Cola. Think about that the next time you're drinking on your beverage of choice. You can pour Coca-Cola on it and it just evaporates the corrosion that's been blocking the power. Let me tell you something. There's some corrosion that has formed in some lives here today and it's blocking the power of God from flowing in your life. It's blocking your communication. It's blocking your ability to hear God. It's blocking your ability to be able to keep moving forward in the way that God wants you to. And it's time for you to get rid of the corrosion because God wants to move you into a place where he can communicate with you. You can communicate with him without hindrance. Can I get an amen? And if you'll allow him to remove that corrosion, I promise you, you're going to start hearing God better. He's going to start hearing you better. And you're going to see the power start flowing again in your life today.